as about half of the audience was made up of experts in the field. And so I know that not all of my audience is maybe suited for this talk, but I wanted to make sure and start including stuff like this on the channel because it really fits into my long-term philosophy of where I want this channel to go. So hopefully you'll watch as much of the talk as you want to, and we'll see you in one of the other videos soon. And thanks, thanks for having me um, give a talk. Okay. okay. So, um, like she said, I'm going to be talking about vertex operator algebras, maybe uh, the definitions and the notion of VOAs at the first half, and then some results involving permutation vertex operator algebras, per permutation orbifolds at the end. As we'll see, like permutation orbifolds are kind of a natural thing to look at for any class of vertex operator algebras. So, Here's a little bit of background. So some motivation for vertex algebras uh, came from construction of affine Lie algebras, you know, by Lepowski and Wilson, Frankel Cax, the Moonshine module and the monster. So that was a, a great book by Frankel, Lepowski, Mormon, and the two-dimensional conformal field theory in physics. And so axiomatization of vertex operators in physics literature um, led to the definition of a vertex algebra by Borchards around 1988, which earned him the Fields Medal uh, years later um, for, like I said, proving the moonshine conjecture. So we can view vertex algebras as some generalization of a Lie algebra, although there's going to be a little bit of a joke about that later, and also kind of a simultaneous generalization of a commutative associative algebra could like have some analytic notion as the sewing of Riemann spheres. And then also we could have some sort of geometric notion in terms of this meromorphic part of two dimensional conformal field theory. Okay, so let's start simple so that maybe like um, we don't lose it, anyone at all in the first couple of slides. So we'll first start talking about associative algebras and we'll use our field to be just the complex numbers. So an associative C algebra is a ring which also has the structure of a vector space. So maybe a standard example that you would teach students in an introductory linear algebra class, but you wouldn't call it an associative algebra, would be n by n matrices with complex entries or real entries, um, really whatever field you want. This is obviously not commutative. We could look at polynomials uh, in indeterminate X and coefficients in C. So this would be a, an example of a commutative associative algebra. Um, maybe this infinite polynomial ring. So we've got infinitely many variables, X naught, X1, X2, so on and so forth. So this is actually a really good model as we'll see for a commutative vertex algebra later. And so, like I said, this is commutative. Maybe we could look at the group algebra. So fix some group, and then we could look at the group algebra over C. And so obviously the commutativity of this depends on the commutativity of the group. And then you could also maybe look at the path algebra of a quiver. I don't know a ton about quivers, but obviously the, commutativity, the commutativity of that will depend on whatever quiver you're working with. And then next, Often you want to attach a certain map to an associative algebra known as a derivation. And so let's say we've got a linear map D from an algebra to itself. It's called a derivation if it satisfies this thing that looks a lot like the product rule from calculus one. And so since it looks like the product rule for cal from calculus one, like a standard example, of a derivation would be just taking the derivative of polynomials with coefficients in C. Or maybe a better example for our purposes later would be this derivation defined on our infinite variable polynomial ring, which takes Xi to Xi plus one. So it would take like X1 to X2, X5 to X6, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, like we can just extend that so it's a derivation. So it's defined by this property and then extended so it's a derivation. So it has this sort of action on this quadratic term. 
Um, and then maybe another nice example that you could give to students in like a linear algebra class would be if, if you fix an n by n matrix, you could de define a derivation out of that matrix as like the commutator with that matrix. So we've got AX minus XA. Okay, so next, moving on from associative algebras, we should look at the notion of a Lie algebra. So it's a vector space over a field. Again, we'll take C together with a bilinear operation, which you, we usually denote by this bracket. And it satisfies, you know, some rules, but maybe the most important are that if you bracket any element with itself, you get zero. So this is like um, some sort of alternating condition. And then we have this condition down here, which is called the Jacobi identity. And it has to do with the lack of associativity of this algebra. So it's like measuring how far away from being associative it is. So what are some examples of Lie algebras? Well, a standard one from a multivariable calculus class would be uh, three-dimensional real vectors with the cross product. Um, so checking that Jacobi identity is a nice homework problem or maybe n by n matrices with a commutator. So that would be a nice linear algebra problem. Or you could look at um, the set of derivations of this Laurent polynomial ring. So this uh, has a special name called the Witt algebra. And as you know, a lot of you guys are probably familiar, the central extension of this is quite important for VOAs. Okay. So here's the idea of a vertex algebra before we get to the careful definition. So we can think of it as a vector space together with infinitely many multiplications indexed by the integers. So the negative products between vectors generalize the multiplication found in commutative associative algebras, whereas the non-negative products between the vectors generalize Lie brackets. So I think of it with like this picture. Oh yeah, and one more thing, there's a derivation that links these products. So I, I like to think of it with this picture, which isn't perfect, but it kind of like gives you the right idea. And so down here, we've got A sub minus one B. Let's say A and B are two elements from the vertex algebra. So this is like as close to being a commutative associative product as you can get within the algebra. And then A zero B, is almost a Lie bracket structure. And in fact, you can easily mod out by something so that you actually do get a, a commutative associative product and a Lie bracket product, but we won't really talk about that. And then as you move up in this direction, um, you just generalize the Lie bracket more. So like A sub one B is generalized Lie bracket, and this is more generalized. And as you move down, you're generalizing this commutative associative product. And then we've got this derivation, which you could call D or T. Sometimes it's called the translation operator, which takes you sort of between these levels. So it's not true that if you apply T to this guy right here, you get this guy right here, but it's just kind of a general picture. <clears throat> Okay, so now we'll look at a definition for a vertex algebra, and we'll start with the parts. So a vertex algebra is a vector space together with a special vector, uh, which call, is called the vacuum, which we'll denote by this bolded one. And then we have a linear map, which is called the vertex operator, going from V to the space of formal Laurent series with coefficients in the endomorphisms of V. So this V sub N is an endomorphism of V, but really what we want to think about is this V sub N attacking another vector is the nth product between V and that other vector. So we're thinking about it as a linear map instead of a multiplication, but you know, algebraically those are the same idea. Okay, and then we also have this linear map, which like I said before, is the derivative operator or like the translation operator, and that takes V to V minus two, one. So that would be like the negative second product of V with the vacuum. And then we have some axioms that this structure needs to satisfy. So if you plug this vacuum vector into the vertex operator, you get just the identity on the vector space. So, 
this is equivalent to saying that the negative first multiplication is the identity operator, but then all other products involving this vacuum are just zero. And then next we have this axiom called the creation axiom, which says that if you attack the vacuum with the negative first multiplication of V, you re-achieve V. And then if you attack the vacuum with a non-negative mode of V, you get zero. So it's like raising you past sort of the vacuum level. And so, you know, that's if and only if this same statement involving vertex operators. So notice we've got this vertex operator hitting the vacuum. And so the constant term of this vertex operator um, is the minus first multiplication. So that gives us the vector. And then after that, you have like a formal power series. You don't have any negative powers of Z anymore. Okay. And then next, we've got this thing called the truncation axiom, which says that there is a natural number attached to any two vectors so that if you multiply them at a level above that natural number, you get zero. And so again, there's an equivalent formulation of that uh, in terms of the vertex operators, which we could also write down. And then that number also plays the role for this thing called locality or weak commutativity. So over here, this is saying that these vertex operators do not commute but they commute up to multiplying by this power of Z minus W. Um, and then one last thing, the translation operator and the vertex operator interact as follows. So their commutator is just the derivative of the vertex operator. Um, okay, so I asked Richard Borchards to make a video about the history of vertex algebras for my YouTube channel. And he said, yes, and it got 17,000 views, which might be more people knowing about vertex algebras than, than ever did in the past. And in that video, he said a lot of uh, misconceptions, which will go against things that I said on the last couple of slides. But I found it interesting that he said these um, misconceptions. Oh, and by the way, he has a YouTube channel too, where he posts um, like algebraic geometry and Lee groups and stuff like that. Anyway, it's a whole weird thing. Okay, so this is straight from him when he made this video. So vertex algebras are not defined as vector spaces over a field, but instead as modules. I think he probably means that vertex algebras are modules of some rings with additional structure. And so I think, uh, I don't remember the name for it at this moment, but I think, uh, kind of object is studied, but uh, more recently it's called something slightly different. It's not called a vertex algebra. It's called like an it integral something of a vertex algebra. I don't remember the exact um, wording, but originally he didn't require them to be vector spaces. And then Second is that vertex algebras were not motivated by two-dimensional conformal field theory or the monster in direct contradiction to my first slide, these applications were quickly noticed by others. And his original motivation was the Lie algebra of the Leach lattice. Um, and then finally, vertex algebras are not generalizations of Lie algebras, again, contradicting something that I, that I said earlier, but instead generalizations of commutative rings where there are poles in the multiplication. Um, so I think, you know, I think most people would consider vertex algebras as some sort of generalization of a Lie algebra. So I find this like third one quite interesting that he doesn't, but that's kind of neither here nor there. Okay, so let's look at a simple example. So this is, like I said, maybe the simplest example of a vertex algebra. It is a commutative vertex algebra. So let's consider a polynomial algebra that's uh, pretty similar to one we looked at before. We have infinitely many variables, but now we'll index them by negative integers, just to put it more in line with the notation that we used before. And then we've got this map T 
which is a derivation and it satisfies the rule. If it hits this monomial X sub minus N, we get N and then X sub, well, that should be minus N minus one. So there's a little bit of a typo there. Um, and then we can extend this as a derivation, like I said, and we can define the minus N minus first product between two polynomials like this. So we apply the derivation n times to the first polynomial, and then we do normal polynomial multiplication with the second polynomial. And then we have a pretty simple example here. So if we take the negative second multiplication of this quadratic term with any polynomial, it like shakes out to be this object right here. So notice we like subtracted one from this, making it x sub minus two, and then we subtracted one from this, making it X sub minus three, like one at a time. And then all non-negative products are zero. So that's one property of like a commutative vertex algebra is that the non-negative products will always be zero. Okay, so next we'll look at maybe the simplest non-commutative example, which would maybe be the Heisenberg vertex algebra, um, which is the algebra of one free boson. So we'll look at like a classic construction for this algebra first. So let's consider a one dimensional vector space with basis vector alpha, we'll call it like this fancy H and we'll view it as an abelian Lie algebra. So the bracket is trivial. And then we form the associated affine Lie algebra. So we'll call it H hat. So it'll be H tensored with Laurent polynomials and then plus this central element, which I didn't notice that this K is a central element, but I'll just say it in words. And then the bracket between elements in H hat is given as follows. So alpha M and alpha N will give you M, this Kronecker delta M plus N zero K, where that's like our central vector. So this is zero if M plus N is zero and it, Sorry, it's one if m plus n is zero and it's zero otherwise. And here we're noting that alpha r is really alpha tensor t to the r, just to make the notation a little simpler. Okay, then next we take a one dimensional representation of like the non negative part of that. So that would be all of the polynomials. So not the Laurent polynomials, but just the polynomials and then the central term. And so we'll have this alpha n act on this vector, which we'll call one. So it looks like the vacuum vector. We'll let that be zero for all n bigger than or equal to zero. And we'll have k act as just the number one. Really you can act as any complex number. Um, you really want it to be a non-zero complex number. Otherwise you're just back at the commutative of algebra on the last slide. And then next we'll form this induced module. So, I mean, th this we're kind of getting into fancy stuff here. So you take the universal enveloping algebra, that should be a hat, I'm missing a hat there, um, of H hat and you tensor it over this universal enveloping algebra with our one dimensional representation. So this has the structure of a vertex algebra where it's generated by a single vector alpha and the vertex operator of that single vector alpha will denote by alpha of z, which is the sum over all integers of alpha and z to the minus n minus one. So there we've got our vertex operator attached to the generator of our vertex algebra. Um, and so maybe like the classic correct way to construct it, but how do you like actually think about it intuitively. I mean, maybe I'm a simpleton or whatever, so I need to think about things like this, but I think probably everyone has like their own little trick for thinking about things intuitively. So the too long didn't read construction of the free boson is that it is linearly just this polynomial ring and infinitely many variables, those variables being alpha minus one, alpha minus two, so on and so forth. And then the action goes like this. So alpha minus N on a vector is just left multiplication by alpha minus N, nice. And then alpha N on a vector is this partial differentiation by alpha, but sorry, by, yeah, that should be an alpha minus N there. So it's partial derivative by alpha 
minus n um, with this extra multiple of n out front. And then alpha zero acts as zero. So I've got a little example down here, which is super simple. So notice if we have V, so it comes from the Heisenberg algebra. So that means linearly it's from this polynomial space. We'll just take this quadratic term. If we multiply by the negative second multiplication with alpha, well, we can just kind of put it in the right order like that. The commutation relations say that we can commute these things. If we multiply by alpha, or sorry, if we multiply by the positive third multiplication with alpha, well, that does a partial derivative with respect to alpha sub minus three. So that's going to give us this. It'll kill this term right here. Okay, good. Um, so a big gap left out here is what about the associated versions of the operations? Like what if we combine some vectors and then want to take one of these multiplications? Well, uh, it turns out that those can be constructed via the vertex operators. So if you take U and V in any vertex algebra, and N is a non-negative integer, then the vertex operator attached to U minus N minus one V is this one over N factorial. And this is called the normally ordered product of the Nth formal derivative of the vertex operator attached to U um, with V. And then I just have down here defined what this normally ordered product is, if you guys um, haven't seen this before. So it, it essentially takes the positive part and the ne negative part of the first term, splits it into pieces, and then arranges it around B like this. And then um, again, if we have n bigger than or equal to zero, then y u n v z. So in other words, the vertex operator attached to u n v is given by this like commutator thing. So notice we've got this sum from k equals zero to n. We've got these binomial coefficients and then this commutator of the case product with a, sorry, that should be u and v, u and v. Um, and like I maybe want to point out here that these two equations really give us some motivation for those non-negative products being generalizations of the Lie algebra because we've got these brackets here, you know, and as we move up to a larger and larger n, we've got this sum of more and more of these brackets. And then here for these negative products, we have this normally ordered product with derivatives attached. So that's kind of as close to being as a, a commutative associative algebra as you can get. Okay, so now we could look at a bigger calculation. And I don't know like if anyone does these calculations more than a couple of times, but you know, I find it uh, useful to see one of these. So notice if we take this vector here, so this is alpha minus three, alpha minus one, one, and we take the negative second multiplication of that with alpha minus four, then that means we need to take the coefficient of z to the one power, because that's what will be attached to this negative second multiplication in the vertex operator of the vertex operator of that times like vector alpha minus four. And so that involves doing this normally ordered product um, and then you end up extracting all of the correct coefficients and you end up with these three terms. So here I've highlighted the beginning and the end. So I wanna point out here that this minus three, minus one, minus four, together with this two minus one equals nine. And so somehow these numbers here are related to this number nine, which we see here, and uh, this four plus four plus one, which we see in this term, and then this four plus three plus two, which we see in this term. So there's some sort of nice appropriate grading that is happening um, with respect to these vectors, as well as these products between the vectors. Okay, so now we're about to turn a corner, maybe I should should have a slide that things are about to get out of hand um, and we'll go a little bit. So um, 
Now we'll talk about sources for more vertex algebra. So we looked at commutative vertex algebra and we looked at the free boson. Those are really good ones to get a handle on. Now we'll talk about some others. So other things like in the same category as the Heisenberg vertex algebra or the vertex algebra of one free boson are these things called free field VOAs, free field vertex operator algebras. So like I said, the Heisenberg VOA is one of them. Then we have the free fermion algebra, the beta gamma system, and then symplectic fermion. So those are all really good examples of simple simple to understand vertex algebras. They are like fairly close to being polynomial rings. Then we have vertex operator, vertex operator algebras associated to Lie super algebras. So you can take a Lie super algebra G, you can find some universal ver vertex algebra associated to it, and it has a unique simple quotient. So we'll denote that by V upper K and L lower K, the universal and the simple quotient. We have uh, VOAs associated to the Virasoro algebra. So you can start with the Virasoro algebra, construct a universal vertex algebra associated to that Virasoro algebra at central charge C, and then you can take the simple quotient. And so we'll denote that by v -vir and l -vir. Um, We have them associated to an integral lattice. So you can take an integral lattice, do a bunch of fancy stuff to it, and create this lattice vertex algebra VL. Now, if L is a root lattice of type ADE, then this VL is isomorphic to this L1 uh, G, in other words, this affine vertex algebra up here. So that's an important result. A lot of times, if you're looking at the level one simple affine VOA, you'll look at it in terms of its um, lattice construction. Okay. Some other ex more exotic sources of VOAs are orbifolds. So that's the set of fixed points under some automorphism, so some invariant subalgebra. Permutation orbifolds, so these are a special class of orbifolds. So if we take a subgroup of the permutation group and it's acting on some um, infold tensor product of a VOA, then we could say that that is a permutation orbifold. And then finally, uh, you know, they're hot right now, but it takes a lot to get them, these W algebras. So you start with a Lie super algebra and a nilpotent. You find an SL2 triple associated to that nilpotent. We'll call it E, H, and F. Um, you can decompose that, you know, uh, with the adjoint action of um, the H. So like the Carton element. Then you form some free field VOA associated to that decomposition, and then you like construct this big VOA CGF um, out of the affine VOA and this free field part. And then you have this vertex algebra homomorphism, which I'll call D. And then this W upper K GF is the homology of the related complex from this last step here. And so this is the universal W algebra at level K associated to the Lie algebra, or Lie super algebra G and the nilpotent F. So you've got a lot of moving parts there. And then if we take this K and put it in the subscript, that, that's how we denote the simple quotient. Okay, so now uh, let's look at sort of our outline for the rest of the talk. So when we're talking about permutation orbifolds, so we'll talk about uh, H3, so that would be the rank three Heisenberg and its invariance under the symmetric group S3. And we'll do that, this is like sort of building towards a project that I'm doing with some students who I think are here for the next couple of minutes. They have a class at 1.30 um, uh, this summer. And then we'll also talk about Sorry, that should be a two right there. I don't know where the quality control is here. So we'll talk about the uh, two-fold tensor product of the universal affine Lie algebra to SL2 and its two permutation orbifold. 
And then we'll look at the case when the level is one and it's three permutation orbifold. That'll have a nice connection to this W23 algebra, um, which is the W algebra attached to, to SL3 with the principal potent. Um, next, we'll look at the two permutation orbifolds and the three permutation orbifolds of the Virasoro algebra. And that'll have some nice connections to this um, universal even spin W algebra with two parameters. Okay, so now this is like sort of a repeat from the previous slide, but we can look at it real quickly. So the rank one Heisenberg algebra, we'll write it a little bit differently here. So it's generated by this one vector. We have its vertex operators given like it was before. Um, and then we have these commutation relations like we described before. And I want to point out that there's this equivalent notion of operator product expansion. And these commutation relations like are the same as this operator product expansion, which I won't define or explain why that's the case at all. Okay. And then we'll set this H3 equal to the threefold tensor product of this rank one Heisenberg with itself. So we've got three commuting copies of this rank one Heisenberg. And, and obviously, S3 acts on this just by permuting these guys. So depending on what permutation you have. So we'll start by diagonalizing the action of one, two, three. And that allows us uh, to push our action of S3 onto um, H2 from H3. So it's really like a dihedral group action which makes this case like slightly different than all of the other permutation cases for this uh, Heisenberg setup. <clears throat> and then we get these sort of starting invariant fields. So we'll call them this omega two AB and this omega three ABC. So as you can see um, under the action of maybe one, two, three, and one, two, that transposition and that three cycle, these two are fixed. So one, two is gonna switch beta one and beta two, and one, two, three will multiply beta one by a third root of unity and beta two by the square of that third root of unity. So we're good to go there. And then we get something similar here for this cubic term. And then uh, by Andy Linshaw, who like sort of, popularized or did a lot of stuff with these invariant theory arguments in VOAs, um, we only require these quadratic generators. So this omega two zero zero up to zero eight. So that means we don't need any derivatives right here and we just need uh, zero second, fourth, sixth and eighth derivative there. And then we can um, get rid of omega 206 and omega 208 just by doing like a straightforward calculation. Um, that writes it in terms of like uh, other elements in the orbifold that are of lower weight. Um, and so through this process, we can reduce the cubic generating set to this like uh, omega 300, 002, 012 you know, through a similar process to what went on over here. So there are these kind of starting base case relations, um, you know, like these, I mean, they're just like some heinous equations. And then we can apply some sort of inductive argument to move it all down with more like general relations. So like these right here. Um, okay, so, um, all in all, um, we can reduce the cubic generating set to this and the quadratic generating set as we did on the previous slide, um, leaving us with generators of weight one, two, three, four, five, six, six. And so that means that this rank three Heisenberg that is invariant under this S3 action is isomorphic to a rank one and this algebra, which we'll call W, which is of type two, three, four, five, six, six. Um, and I think like recently, uh, we have found some other algebras of this type, two, three, four, five, six, six of the right central charge. So it's possible that like 
pretty quickly, we could have some sort of isomorphism between this algebra, which we're calling W here, and something a little bit um, more interesting, or not more interesting, but something interesting that's been constructed some other way. Um, okay, and then just to sort of give a shout out to the project that I'll do with my students, uh, which is really just gonna be an extension of this to rank four Heisenberg, which I think might be actually a little bit easier because four is equal to two times two and two is a smaller prime than three. Um, so I think you can do a lot of like Z2 orbifolds on themselves to look at uh, permutation orbifolds of this rank four Heisenberg algebra. And there's a lot of like little sub projects that we could do here because S4 has more subgroups than S3. Anyway, I, this is a game that we're gonna play with students this summer, uh, which I think will be fun, and they'll learn a lot about working together and being stuck on math problems and the like, which is really important. <laughs> um, we can also have some results about the characters. So via invariant theory, uh, something similar to the Molin series um, or Molin theorem from classical invariant theory, we can calculate the character for this S3 orbifold. So it has these three parts. And uh, there are some nice modular invariance properties of this character given as follows. So notice we have these like integrals involving the character instead of sums, which you might have usually. Okay. So now uh, I, I've talked about this S3 orbifold in previous talks, but now th this is the first time I've talked about this. S2 orbifold of this uh, two-fold tensor product of the universal level K SL2 algebra. So this is brand new. Uh, I think I'm gonna make a YouTube chalk talk about it, but I haven't done that yet. So we wanna consider two commuting copies of the universal VOA associated to the level K, which is not equal to two. Um, that's the critical level of SL2. So we'll denote the generating vectors by H1, E1, F1, H2, E2, F2. And so we've got non-trivial OPE given by the following. And you can think about this in terms of commutation relations too, if you're psyched. Um, so we'll take a general, the same general strategy that we did before. It's just the calculations are quite a bit more difficult because we have this parameter K in the mix. So we diagonalize the action. So we've got this level 2K SL2, which is given by H, E, and F. And then we've got this alpha X and Y, which are negated under the generator for S2. So that gives us a nice generating set for the orbifold that we can initially take. So this S2 orbifold will be initially generated by these three fixed vectors over here, which have the diagonal sub VOA, which is of level 2K. And then apart from that, we have these quadratic generators made up of the guys that are negated. And so I won't sketch the proof or look at any of the calculations, uh, but we can reduce this to generators uh, of the following forms. So this is one, 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 six generators of weight two and three generators of weight three. And so this is the diagonal SL2. And then we have these and these coming from the quadratic generators. And this is only true when K is not equal to eight. When K is equal to eight, you would get a zero in a denominator of the lowest weight Decoupling relation, if K is equal to eight, you have to include like a couple of generators of weight four. I don't know why K is equal to eight. I, I don't know if that's important for anything that just happened. Eight didn't seem to be important for any reason. Okay. And then since our generators end at weight three, that means if there are no singular vectors at weight three, two, or one, then the S2 permutation orbifold of the simple quotients is also of this type, 
right? You can only get rid of some of these generators if um, we have null vectors in, you know, the parent algebras. And that's what we'll look at, you know, right now. Okay, so now moving on to the simple quotients. So instead of taking the twofold tensor product of the universal level K algebra, we're taking the twofold tensor product of the simple quotients and doing the permutation orbital fold of that. And again, just looking at what's going on in the universal case, and playing around with the null vectors at appropriate level, we can get the following kind of extra results. Um, a couple of which are nice, and one of which just allows us to get rid of a couple of vectors. So if you take the level one tensor with itself and do that S2 overfold, you get this simple level two SL2 tensored with this central charge half simple Virasoro. So that's pretty nice. If you do the level half um, case, you get this maybe two-fold tensor product of the beta gamma system, but then orbifolded by the dihedral group D4. So this is like a rank two beta gamma system and then the D4 orbifold of that. So that's an interesting like coincidental isomorphism. And then finally, if you take the minus four thirds, level where well, you can just get rid of the weight three generators and that's because the the minus four thirds level you get null vectors at weight three um okay and so if you move on to the s3 orbifolds uh things get a bit more complicated and so we only looked at the case when we had level one and so we could use some previous results and also the lattice construction so like I said, we're the simple level one um, VOA for SL2, the threefold tensor product of that. So that can be embedded inside of um, a lattice VOA. So we've got this like lattice VOA um, with Z alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, where alpha I alpha I is two, is going to be isomorphic to this threefold tensor product. And then, by a previous result involving um, this lattice VOA, you can decompose it into the following um, modules for SL2 and modules for the Virasoro given like this. So this would be like a, a level three module for the for SL2, and then this would be you know some modules for Virasoro. Um, and then we could collapse those into just this uh, VR module M and then M prime. So just collapsing all of those guys. So it's a little bit simpler. And so again, these guys showed that the Z3 orbifold was the simple quotient of um, W23 with central charge six fifths. Um, and then from that, we have that the S3 orbifold, which is like the Z2 orbifold of the Z3 orbifold, will be the Z2 orbifold of this W algebra. Um, but this W algebra was studied by Andy Linshaw and student Ali, um, and it was determined to be of type 2, 6, 8, 10, 12. The universal one is at least. You can get rid of some of those vectors in uh, this simple quotient, I believe. Um, you can get rid of the vector 12 in this simple quotient. Um, okay, and then putting that together with the previous result involving the decomposition of the lattice VOA, we have that VLS3, so this was like uh, rank three lattice, which is like a diagonal lattice, all the SL2 copies. So this is like a level three SL2 uh, together with this Z2 orbifold of that W algebra, and then direct sum with a couple of modules for each. Um, and then we have a highest weight vector calculated for uh, the modules for each as described over here. So it's 
the orbit sum of this z tilde vector where this z tilde is given like this. And then finally, you get the type in the end for this orbifold, which is uh, one, uh, one, one, and then two, three, six, eight, ten. Okay, so now we can move on to permutation orbifolds of Virasoro algebras. So we'll consider the universal Virasoro vertex algebra with central charge C. And so that's generated by conformal vector omega. And then generally you would write LZ if you wanted to write it as a field for the vertex operator associated to omega. And these component operators are given by these LNs and they're like, uh, shifted a little bit with respect to the grading. So we've got this Z to the N, minus N minus two. So all that pretty standard. And then we have these standard commutation relations for these operators. And that's equivalent to having the OPE for the field. Um, and then we could consider like we did before in the Heisenberg case, the n-fold tensor product of these universal Virasoro algebras with themselves. And so this is generated by n conformal vectors, which we'll denote by omega one up to omega n. So let's look at the rank two case first. And so we have a total Virasoro here of omega one plus omega two. So it's the sum of the two diagonal conformal vectors. And then apart from that, we've got these quadratic operators in the original fields. And so we'll call this WM plus four. So this is gonna be L1 minus two minus M and L1 minus two, one, and then the same thing with L2. And then we'll denote the fields as LZ and W upper KZ. And together with uh, Anton and Chris Sadowski, um, we found this S2 orbifold of this algebra. I think it just like recently appeared in Journal of Algebra. And so, uh, and we didn't have any, we didn't have to make any corrections. And the joke was that because it was like a YouTube fan that was the, reader. That's neither here nor there. So it was, it's strongly generated by this Virasoro vector and then W4, W6, and W8. So it's type 2, 4, 6, 8, which is important to notice because those are all just even numbers. And so that could be attached to some fairly recent result of um, Lynchon Kanad, which we'll see in just a little bit. And then at this strange central charge of uh, 128 over 47, you've got to include something else. Okay, and so like I alluded to, there's a fairly recent result of Andy Lynchon, Shashank Kanad, and they rigorously constructed this universal even spin two parameter W algebra um, with parameters C and lambda. It's type W2468, blah, 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 blah. And they give a strategy in their paper for proving coincidental isomorphisms between um, these types of even spin vertex algebras. And it all has to do with calculating this lambda and looking at intersections on this lambda curve. So this lambda is like a curve um, depending on C. So anyway, you can get all of the information you need from the third product of the weight four vector with itself. So in that universal algebra, so which I'll denote by this like W infinity, that's from their universal algebra, the third product of this W four vector with itself is given by this like monstrosity. But then in our orbifold, we can calculate it as follows. Um, but then after setting up appropriate equations and then re, um, you know, multiplying by constant as needed, we can find these overlapping points for central charges, giving these coincidental isomorphisms. So the simple quotient S2 orbifold is isomorphic to this um, Z2 orbifold of this WK algebra 
sorry, this W algebra uh, for SO2N with the principal nilpotent for the following central charges and levels. And then we also have like some more results um, involving these parafermion algebras. So, um, and then I think there's one more result, but I didn't include a, a slide for it where it is related to a SL in algebra. Okay, so here are some other interesting cases of the simple quotient, um, just kind of real quickly. So the minus 22 over five case is always gonna be interesting because that's the sort of simplest central charge for the Furosoro. So in that case, you actually get the minus 44 over five Furosoro after looking at the orbifold. Minus 68 over seven is also gonna be interesting because that's like the next lowest um weight null vector occurs at this central charge well that is tied with this like central charge of a half so we get um two results related to that and then these kind of other results that are also like sort of random and happen because we have a null vectors at the appropriate weight for these given central charges um and then here are uh some theorems that were presented as conjectures. I think I last time I uh, gave this talk, but now they're theorems. So this was, in, these are both in the uh, Journal of Algebra paper. So for generic C, the Z3 orbifold of this threefold tensor product of the universal Virasoro is of this type. So we've got two, four, five, three, sixes, seven, three, eight, three, nines, and two tens. And then we worked out a couple of simple quotients. So in the case that we have the central charge minus 22 over five, um, a lot simplifies. We just get two, five, six, nine for the Z3 orbifold. And the fact that we just get two, five, six, nine for the Z3 orbifold meant that it was possible to figure out the S3 orbifold in that case, because we could just take the Z2 orbifold on top of this and it's of type two, six. And uh, in process is us working out the S3 orbifold for generic central charge instead of just minus 22 over five. And um, there is uh, an isomorphism between this S3 orbifold at C equals minus 22 five and some nice affine W algebra that I mean is obviously also of level two six. Um, and I think um, that's all I have. And I have, uh, th I've decided that this is the vertex algebra mascot. It's the normally ordered platypus. So thanks for having me again. <laughs>